Welcome to this week's episode of Fortitude and Truth. My name is Nate. I'm here with my brother, Andrew, and we have quite a show in store for you. But before we get into it, just a few housekeeping items. Just a reminder, we do post our podcast every Friday at 8 a.m., so make sure to check it out. Uh, We are currently on Spotify, iHeartRadio, a couple of the other uh, popular hosting sites. Still working on getting all of them nailed down. But we appreciate your patience with that. So go ahead and subscribe to one of those. That way you get a notification every time we post a new episode. Also, uh, we do have a surprise, not surprise, but a special Christmas episode for you, which we'll be dropping on Christmas morning. And we're going to give you our brief thoughts. We're not going to do a full hour on the thoughts on the purpose and meaning of Advent and Christmas. And we thought that was appropriate, especially early on in this show. But today, we've got a show in store for you. The last few weeks, we've been going through the attributes of Scripture, and now we want to kind of turn the tables and talk about you and me and Andrew and all of us as Christians and kind of what that journey looks like. So we'll give you our verse for the week is 1 Corinthians 12, 27, which says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. I think that right there just says enough, right? The we are the body of Christ. That's the church universal, not the church local. But that means some things for the church local. So that's something we're going to be talking about today. So maybe you're a recent convert. Maybe you just got saved. And praise God, that's, that's a wonderful thing to hear. And maybe down the road you listen to this you find us on podcasts after just getting saved and you listen to this and and we very much want to encourage you on your journey Uh, but what we so when we talk christian journey there's a couple things that come to mind obviously it's a lifelong it's race uh the bible calls it talks about running a race kind of like a marathon that's lifelong uh theologians have called it progressive sanctification which is pretty accurate uh, it's and which is growing in holiness, not to be confused with positional sanctification, which is being set apart from sin in order to serve God, which kind of happens when you get saved. Think, think of it as salvation, yeah. Yeah, very similar to salvation. But the Christian journey means things. There are certain things that are not laws per se, but are kind of expected, and things that are to to that the Bible kind of mandates as far as you know. You're a Christian. This is kind of what's Kind of what's expected of you to, and part of growing in the likeness of Christ is not growing individually, but collectively. And so that's where we see the need for church membership. The need for fellowship of the brethren. And I'm actually a little surprised here because Andrew chose the focus verse today, and I kind of thought he'd go with Hebrews 11.25. I did almost go with that one. <laughs> which... If you don't know, Hebrews 11.25 says, Not forsaking, and this is KJV, sorry, I can't get this one out of my head because I memorized this one a long time ago. Uh, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I I, I believe that's Hebrews 10.25, and we will touch on it today. Oh! (laughs) No I, no, I did. I did. I know I exactly. I got burned. No, no, you didn't. I, I, I know exactly what you're referencing, and you, in one of our segments, we hit on that one. Oh, perfect. So, in any case, though, the need for ch- not just being a part of a church, but the, the importance of church membership and having a local body in which to kind of live out um, Christ's will in your life, both for his glory and for his church, and part of that. Again, his church is not just your local body, but is the church universal. And that means some things as well that we may or may not touch on this episode. Um, But that's that's probably part of a a larger discussion. And so finally, we'll probably close, we're going to close this show with the idea of some tips to identify the right church if you're looking for a church. Uh, You may be part of a church now that is not helpful, not giving you what you need. And that's not the whole purpose of church. You should not be going to church every Sunday looking for to be fed. Um, That's an important part of church. You should be looking to worship and glorify God. Uh, But if you are not being fed, if you are not given the opportunity to worship, glorify God, because you're being distracted by other things, then maybe maybe it's time to look for another church. Um, 
I think we'll dedicate a show later on down the road about um, signs to leave a church. And we're not there yet, and so I don't want to encourage you to leave a church that you're in for any other reason. Uh, but I would also say that this, the, the tips that we're going to give you are ways to identify churches that are on the right, on somewhat on the right track. And if your church isn't on those, then maybe that's that's a question to ponder. Um, but that is up to you. Or maybe, you know, you if you aren't a member of a church, you just got saved. Again, praise God. But that means you need to find you can get plugged in. And I'm sure that whoever helped lead you to the Lord would love to see you go to their local church. And that's probably a good place to start. But ultimately, uh, God's got a plan for you, and you need to find the church that best suits both your gifts and where your your gifts also suit the body uh, at large. And because there are different churches where, you know, the church may be a great church, but it's not God's plan for you to stay there long term. And it's sometimes just time to move on. And God's got a, a grander call on your life than the local church. Ultimately, your call is to God, not to one specific local group, if that makes sense. So without further ado, uh, we're going to turn it over to Andrew to kind of lead us through uh, what is the Christian journey and really kind of the path that one should kind of take um, upon getting saved and then kind of what the the steps are throughout your lifetime to continue to reassess that. Yes, I am. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Um, so <clears throat> I think they did a phenomenal job introducing this idea of, you know, this, again, praise God. He said it a couple of times. That's awesome. Praise God. That's correct. Praise God. I'll say that again, that you've been saved. You have, you have eternal security. That's a great thing. But as we're now, now you're stepping into that proper perspective of, well, I'm an ambassador. This is not my home. And now what? Right, that that can be some pretty pretty deep waters, if you will, pretty unsettled waters, um, to to be casting your gaze upon, if you will. Um, so, what does it mean, first of all, that you have eternal security? Because I think having a proper perspective of that helps as we begin to move forward into next steps and discipleship and all of these good things. What does it mean? that you now are eternally secure or eternally separated from sin, as, as Nate was mentioning earlier. And that's a big deal, right? First of all, it's important to understand, and this is introducing a topic that Nate and I could probably speak at length to before the show, actually, we were talking a bit about this. Um, we may end up, and more than likely we'll end up talking about this, but that's the holiness of God, right? Understanding that God is holy. And it's easy to say something like that and kind of half-cocked, brush it off, like, oh, it's no big deal, you know, or, or yeah, we get it, yeah, 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 I get it, God's holy. No, do you really get it? God is holy. He is perfectly pure. He is without sin, without, when pure means, when you look at the idea of even pure, it means that every, nothing that is not that does not belong is not there. So in other words, everything that needs to be there is there, and nothing bad exists there, right? It's morally and uh, right religiously, there's the word, sorry, y'all, religiously upright, right? So you know what we can think of this is sinless. By his very nature, God is sinless, and he saved you, right? You, me, Amen. Nathan, sorry, I keep going that, Nate, sorry. <laughs> um, Eventually, I'll just go by Nathaniel and mess it, you all up. Well, no, I'm actually prepared for that. I like that, but that's good. all of us, right? We we're stuck in a mire that it, a, p- a pig pen is a great example. I've heard it used before, right? You're, you're dirty, right? You're, you're filthy in your sin. You can't do anything about it. But yet the God who is sinless and perfect by his very nature stepped in and became sin for you. That is something that should instill a level of humility that is really puts things in the proper perspective. Again, like I said, that's the little synopsis, little cliff notes, if those of you know what that is, version of that. We, there, I can almost guarantee there will be episodes in the future talking about the holiness of God where we will hyper-focus on it as we should because the scripture says God is holy, holy, holy. Um, if you don't want to listen to us, I would highly suggest, and I've gone through it a couple of times now, Stephen J. Lawson has a series on YouTube called The Attributes of God where we talk, they talk about... His holiness, his aseity, um, his love, his wrath, his justice, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his immortality, his imminence, 
Um, it's a long list. It's a long series. It's really good though, and they kind of he really dives deep into all these attributes. Um, yeah. Just be careful of the theological skew. Uh, you may not agree wholeheartedly with certain things that carry um, some, kind of t- some connotations with his um, theology. But remember to just ground yourself in Scripture. And he does do a good job of uh, yeah. using Scripture to be his guide. Um, to further Andrew's point a little bit, though, I would say when we talk about being saved, when you think about it, it's not just being stuck in the miry clay. Um, I think Scripture uses that that stuck in the mirror crying he said my feet upon the rock yeah um but also like paul very much says we are dead to our sins and what is dead cannot live unless someone else raises it that's a very good point which is even more humbling right there's nothing you could do to save yourself and yet he still came and saved you you and you weren't even just like neutrality with god right i think we forget yeah. that We're like oh i know i'm dead to my sins but he saved me and that's great and amen I'd that, say that dead is in your sins that is true yeah. We're dead in our sins, yes, not to our sins. We are dead to our sins now. Not, yeah, that's, that's why I, I knew that was the point you're making. So right. um, we are dead in our sins, but also we were not because we were sinners. But in front, in the face of a holy God, we are enemies with God. So not only we do are we sinners, but we also face God as His enemy, not His friend, not Hostile. not from a neutral standpoint, but we are His enemy. And yet, apparently, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and he that's not how that works but he chose to to send his son to die and save us is just i grow a the more i understand my sin and the more i understand how god sees my sin the more truly just humbled i am that he would do what he did i think i might you would think he, i'm gonna say this i you would think you would get used to oh jesus died for my sins but i think it is more profound now than it ever has been. Yeah. And I wonder if as I continue and, and probably as Paul did, that like as I continue the centrality of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ becomes that much more powerful and that much more awe like inspiring in my own life. And that is something I never saw coming uh, when I first converted. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a phenomenal point, brother. I appreciate that um that context and that addition and that perspective. They're deepening it for sure. As you can see, we uh, really enjoy this topic, but um, it, it, that's a f- phenomenal point. I think that's part of the sanctification process, which again, is just the whole God by the Holy Spirit growing us deeper and deeper in the image of Christ. Um, that then and, and Paul in, entitles this, or encapsulates this perfectly right throughout his epistles. And I, I want to say, um, I think it's Romans, or maybe it's First Corinthians, the conflict of the two natures, where, where Paul is talking about how he he does the things he hates knowingly. Um, what you don't know this? It's Romans seven. Yeah, it was, it was Romans. Okay, it's I was right. Romans yeah, 7. yeah, I knew it was either Romans or First Corinthians. Yeah, Romans seven, phenomenal. So, but yeah, it, but Paul, you see that encapsulated perfectly in the life of Paul, right? And he identifies in num- numerous places that, that the more he grows with Christ, the, the more he grows to hate his sin and identify that. And I think that that is absolutely part of, of the Spirit's work in us, continuing to conform us to the image of Christ. That you, even Like Nate said, I think that's great. Like You think that you would get used to that idea, right? You, oh, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. I'm going to praise God. But no, like... It, the more I, I find it's true in my own walk, the more I grow and like when God used the Marine Corps in my life to really face, f- face me to face myself, really force me to face myself rather. Um, the depths of disgust that I had with myself and, and then yet at the same time, you know, Christ died for my sins. Christ died for me. He, he, rect- he reconciled me to God. I am his child. He is my advocate. Like these kinds of things are immensely humbling. And it's something that it just grows deeper and deeper in. Um, but yeah, and, and again, this kind of ties in lovely, I should say, beautifully. Uh, chef's kiss for those of you young youths out there. I don't know. That's what the youths say. I work with the youths, so I get to, I get to hear their speak. But anyway, um, <laughs> about having the important and that proper perspective of the idea that we have been bought. Like, so with this idea that God's holy and he saved us, and those are, one day we'll have video and you'll see, because I'm making a point, I'm illustrating with my hands right now, and it's magnificent. But anyway, um, that he bought us with his blood. 
And that price, again, was his blood. And we have to understand the implications, as, as Paul outlines, that he's a slave of Christ. Right? He was a slave to sin, but now he's a slave of Christ. That, that, that picture, that illustration was not an accident. Um, that, that is very, very much so intentional. That's how we need to view ourselves. And when we look at a couple of scripture references that kind of bear out this point that, that Nate and I have been talking about, we see here um, in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18 through 20, excuse me, the Bible says, Fully sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person commits is outside, this, outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, in the context here in 1 Corinthians um, 6, it's obviously, as it, we start out in verse 18, it's talking about sexual immorality specifically. But then we see a more general point and it's, that ties into this specific point that we were bought with a price. Right? That, that, that comes with a responsibility, for one, in this context, to honor, God, honor our body, right? honor God with our bodies. Um, and understanding that that comes, again, with a responsibility. Um, I think Paul does a good job here, too, of not just not just you were bought, or sorry, not just to honor the God with your bodies because your body's indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but then he gives you the why, right? And I'm sure this is where you were going, so I'm stealing your thunder. But, That's okay. But the idea that you were bought, but why were you, or what, the, I, I'm getting ahead of myself now. Um, <laughs> the idea to glorify God with your body because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But it's a temple of the Holy Spirit because you were bought with a price, right? You are indwelt with the Holy Spirit because you are, uh, you are now friends with God because he paid the price. So Paul really does a good job here of, of building upon that own argument of he gets specific and then he gets more general and then he gives the purpose. Yeah. He gets to, you were bought with the price, of which is the precious blood of Christ that because you were bought, that means something, right? It isn't just you're bought with the blood of Christ. Hey, now everything's hunky-dory. It's, hey, honor God with your bodies because you were bought. So being bought has implications to it. No, absolutely. No, and that's a phenomenal point. And I would argue that's the the proper perspective, right? Because it's easy, and, and whether you're immature in your walk or even as you mature, and, and how Satan's at can can use these things to puff you up, right? Well, the Holy Spirit indwells me. Right? I was chosen. Um, this kind of stuff where it becomes very myopically about oneself, and then we see here in context, and this is not the only place where where the, where Scripture speaks like this. Um, that yeah, that's true. But why is that true? It's true because of what Christ did, and ultimately what God did, right? That, that's why. So again, it should draw you back into the only reason why any of this is possible is because God made a way. God redeemed. When, again, it's a free gift, a gra- you know, that's the idea of grace, right? The gi- free gift of God that we did not earn. And that, that's, that, that's like, I think, part of you know, what Paul's doing here in context here in for, uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Again, by going specific, like my op- this very specific general, and then giving, like Nate said, the why. Um, I think that's very important. It, get, it kind of yearns in that proper perspective that you are not your own. Further, we see in Romans 6, verses 16 through um, 19, this is going to sound like a whole paragraph because it is. This is how Paul often wrote. Well, wrote like he spoke. But nonetheless, this context was important, I felt. So the Bible says in Romans 6, verses 16 through 19, Do you not know that the one whom you present yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of that same one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form, sorry, form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And after being freed from your sin, you became slaves to righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented the parts of your body as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your body parts as a slave to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Now this is building on that same idea, right? That this idea that, make no mistake, you either are a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness and or a slave to God, 
right? There's this idea that you can kind of be, like Nate pointed out earlier in the intro, neutral. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I know sin upsets God. I know sin makes him grumpy, uh, gives him boo-boo belly, you know, all of that. But I'm kind of neutral. Um, you're, you're, you're not neutral, right? You, when you're a slave to sin, you are an enemy of God. Like, you are hostile. Like, Scripture points out that you are hostile to God. Um, and again, that we're talking about the joyous experience of being saved. And that's a praise God for that. So I'm not trying to damper this, but, but the next steps are seeking that proper perspective and truly through the word and, you know, God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit leading us into all truth, understanding a baseline proper perspective of our relation and what we contributed to our own salvation. Um, and that's right. Do you have anything to add? You were leaning in like you might have had something. Pretty much, I was going to say, we didn't really contribute much to our own salvation, yeah. but but that means something, right? There's, I've read some plenty of books, not to steal too much time here, on <laughs> the idea of holiness, and um, there's some movements in the church, unfortunately, where um, like the hyper-grace movement and the antinomian movement, uh, if you don't know what those are, look those up. Very dangerous, but they are this idea where they, they feel like, not necessarily that they're neutral, but they feel like because they're on God's side, they can just do whatever they want. And uh, that's not not the case. Um, you were saved for a purpose, and it's not to, to sin. And so that is all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, well, but, might, might I submit to you, maybe you tell me what you think, but I think that part of the issue there is they would describe God is on their side. And I think that's a different statement than they are on God's side. Um, I, this is a problem. I was having this conversation on this note because I think that's a valuable thing. Because this is a, a pitfall you can fall into. And as a you know immature Christian, there's nothing wrong with that. Again, praise God. You are his child. Um, and that's a beautiful thing. But it can be very easy to fall into emotional teachings or teachings that will tell you that, well, God's on your side now. It's like, well, that's a fundamentally misordered statement. No, it's up to you to be on God's side. What are your I, thoughts of that? I, I agree. Uh, look at the example of the Israelites and how, how that went for them. <laughs> yeah. Right? It went swimmingly. <laughs> they, God was on their side, right? They were on God's side because God chose, God chose um, Jacob and chose yeah. Israel to be his people. But when it came down to, we look at some of the military conquests in the uh, in the Old Testament. It's very much, oh well, God's on our side, so we can just beat anybody. Like not not how that works. I wish Wrong. it were right, but we are on God's side. Like if we go, like so, when the ark, especially if we just look at the Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ark of the Covenant goes in front, and very often that was what led to military battles because they were on the side of God. Right, yeah. they followed God's command into battle. They followed God into battle through the ark, Absolutely. and when either they forgot the ark or or mis mishandled the ark, or the ark was in the back when it was supposed to be in the front, then it's oh well, then God's on our side, so we can just we can win anything. And yes, God is on your side, but you are first and foremost on God's side. Yeah, well, no, and I, I think, and I don't mean to draw that distinction in our, our like. I, I just, I notice that, and usually the people that w either, and I, I'm talking what I mean by the people, I mean the teachers that will teach from the perspective of God is on your side. Respectfully, and I mean this respectfully, no matter whom it is, that should send up a red flag, and you should not necessarily mark and avoid or rebuke, but ask a clarifying question. Because what that, again, what that implies, this idea that God is on your side, is that God is now subjugated to to you, right? To to how you're feeling or what you want to do or what your feelings are telling you to do. And to, while now you're saved, that's, again, praise God. I'll keep saying that because it's a phenomenal thing. It's an awesome thing. We're all ec ecstatic that that's happening. Um, but especially when you've been just newly converted and you're relatively immature in your faith, that's, that's when Satan's going to bring across someone who appeals to your feelings, I would argue, though, it's not just those of you who may or may not be new to the faith, but just immature. That's fair enough. And that's that might be hard to hear. Um, I'm sure it's hard to hear if, I, if when someone said to me, but you're subject to these temptations your entire Christian walk. The idea and the temptations are different, right? The Some, method is different. They're, sure. they're, the method is different. The yeah. the idea that, but 
your flesh is still the same, right? Your flesh is still sinful. Your, fre- your flesh has desires. And so, and the enemy knows whatever your flesh wants, he's going to throw that in front of you. So you want this, even though you might be like grounded in emotions and things like that. And, and that's fine as long as it's subjected to the word of God, but he's going to throw in front of you false teachers who are preaching like, emotion experience over scripture who are doing all these things and maybe not overtly but kind of slyly and so that's just it's very important to be wise and diligent so this is something i know we keep kind of harping on the the new christian or maybe even the immature christian or maybe the re not the reconvert but like somebody who came back from some stumbling but at the same time we face a lot of these struggles on a daily basis in different ways so just that's true these things still apply just being mindful of them yeah no that's a very very good point and that's absolutely correct so again the whole the whole point of that again is to understand that we are slaves to christ or you know as paul would point out you know paul, the apostle paul a slave of jesus christ excuse me a slave of god you know this idea and there's that that use of slave is very intentional granted culturally it carried, excuse me, slightly different connotation, slightly, not dramatic, but a slightly different understanding than maybe how us in America would understand slavery. But nonetheless, the the message is still pretty coherent, even for us. Um, So again, we are a slave to God. And I, Paul and, um, Apostle Paul even implores us in, I believe it's 1 Timothy 4, no, 2 Timothy 4, you know, to run the race that's been set before you, um, he implores Timothy to run the races. Again, what race? Not the race you want to run. The race that's been... And I believe this, granted, again, that's in the context of, you know, the pastoral ministry. But the principle that can be drawn from that for every believer is that this idea that we don't get to choose what race we're running. God has set the race before us. And we are to run that race. Further in Scripture, and this is going to be, we see in another example, in Philippians 3, verses 9 through 11, and then verse 14. Uh, scripture says, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. I'm sorry, let me let me just give us some context. I got kind of this is the middle of one of Paul's um, uh, many run on sentences. Um, he's talking about ultimately, as we'll see in verse fourteen, letting go of what lies behind and pressing forward to what lies ahead. Right, pressing forward to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's that's the message here. So that's what we're. This is the context. Again, pick it up in verse nine. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's a magnificent statement. Being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I just want to pause before we go to verse 14. That is a beautiful statement. Notice, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And he doesn't stop there. And the fellowship of his sufferings. That is, a, that is quite the follow-up statement. Right? Even further, being conformed to his death. That he may somehow attain the resurrection from the dead. And further in verse 14, that's where I was telling you the context here, right? The scripture in um, uh, sorry, Philippians 3, verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So this idea of letting go what lies behind, moving forward, and the idea of understanding that we are going to share in the sufferings that Christ had. And we should be happy and honored to do that and humbled to do that. Um, and being conformed to his death where we die to self. That's what you know. really pulls out... Like, talking about dying to the self, the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, your, your previous goals. Um, like I know, and this is, again, anecdotal, so take it for what it's worth, but when I was saved, God, God, I, God radically changed. I mean, maybe to the outward viewer, it wasn't as radical as it really was, but like everything about me changed. Um, my trajectory, my goals, my thoughts for my life, all of that went out the window and a brand new slate came in. Um, to the point where you know, I can imagine it scaring my parents, and not that you know, they, not that they were thought it was a bad thing that I was, you know, was walking with God and all that, but the fact that you know, my old path of I'm going to go here and do this, and you know, I'm going to be in the business world, all all this kind of different stuff, all of that 
and the snap of a finger went out the window. And I know that's not the case for everybody, but that for me that was the that was the case. And you know and that this radical change of dying to self, what you think you wanted, well, God knows what you need, and it's about putting on that perspective. And that perspective needs to happen daily. Absolutely, I would argue my my experience is very different. <laughs> At the same time, that doesn't discredit either of them, and yeah. I think. As as helpful, I think, as maybe that would have been for me <laughs> to have that aha moment. Um, I think for me, it was better for me personally to learn that I have to die to self every day. And I have to continue to die to self. And when I don't die to self, my sin gets in my way and it clouds my relationship with God. No. But if I die to self, he must, I must decrease so that he I might increase. increase. Amen. Because his power is perfected in my in my weakness. No, that's and letting him take control. Because, I mean, Paul said it, the, we're talking about Romans 7, the good that I do is not even from me, it's from God. Yeah. Who works through me. Amen. No, it's, no, and really quick on that note, and then we'll, we'll kind of bring this segment to a close, but even with that, um, a concrete next step would be finding a tr- proper discipleship relationship, discipling relationship, um, where you have a mentor. Uh, that's a phenomenal step, because that's one thing I did not have. And the way God provided it, I am praise God for it, it was definitely a longer path, a path that I would argue that, I mean, obviously God knew I needed but that's why discipleship is so akin on my heart and such a passion for me specifically. And it should be a passion for all of us, but I feel like God has really called me to redeem that and to seek to facilitate that in a multitude of others' lives through the ministry and my, and my pastorate when he gives it to me because of what I went through. Um, it was quite the journey. But anyway, uh, so in short, our perspective should be progressively and actively changed right so as we move forward you know our next steps almost immediately are, we should be seeking that progressive and active change meaning progressive meaning it continues right that like the idea of continue you know, progressive sanctification which again is a deep theological term which means a continued right so continued and active meaning you are actively participating to the extent that you can changing your perspective from the temporary right or the flesh or the world uh, to that of the heavenly Right, which we think of as you know being led by the Spirit, living by the Spirit, the eternal perspective, right, the exp- the perspective of God, um, and what He's doing in your life. That that truly is the next steps, which ultimately takes you again to finding a mentor, which is closely related to finding a church, a local body. Um, and they, um, if we, we briefly talk about this in the next segment, talking about the responsibilities of being a child of God in reference to the corporate body. Um, I let you take it away there. Brief, briefly explain. <laughs> take all day. <laughs> yeah, being a child of God. First thing, you're you are not your own. Second thing, I uh, clearly God created us for relationship. Um, our senior pastor here has created a wonderful perspective that has really opened my eyes to. We talk about love, and we talk about all these doctrines. Um, I think one thing that clouds my intellectual mind is this idea of relationship and the idea that we were created for relationship because God is in an infinitely perfect relationship as a triune being. That's a phenomenal point. He does do a good job of that. And so because he does it perfectly, he created us in his image. We were meant for relationship. That's why Adam couldn't find a suitable helper until God created him woman. And so on and so forth. So we are designed to have this relationship and not just, I mean, I have, you know, my family and my wife and I love them very dearly, but we were created for something more, something deeper, a relationship with our, we are image bearers of Christ, of God. We were created in the image of God. And so we were also designed for a relationship with him, but that doesn't mean it's just a relationship with him. It's not like I just have a relationship with God and no one else. Um, no one lives life like that. No one should live life like that. You were designed to fellowship. Even if you're an introvert, find yourself some introverts. It's okay. You can have one or two people. You, no one's asking for you to have an army. Um, but you should be, you should surround yourself with people who, who think godly, who push you to be holy, who, and not everybody has a perfect group of friends, I promise. So don't think we do, but just pushing yourself to, to really look at your friendships and look at your, relationships with your family and who is pushing you and who is not and 
obviously those are also a chance for witnesses. I'm not saying all your friends should be saved, your family should be saved. You can't force that on them. But those are also opportunities to share the gospel. What a great point. But also, too, like we look at church and and the purpose that God created the church, right? And there's a couple things here. So I want to touch on the like the unity of the church as well as the function of the church. Because I think we get lost in local churches and all these denominational divides and all these things that divide us when really there's one thing that unifies us and that's the most important when we talk about christ um paul says in ephesians 4 verse 4 there is one body and one spirit just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is over all and through all and in all but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of christ's gift and if you skip down to verse 11 he says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And we hear, but I'm going to pause here. We hear the word ministry. We think of pastors, right? Pastors are ministers. They, they do the work of the ministry. But the saints do the work of the ministry. Who are the saints, Nate? All of those who are <laughs> saved. Amen. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> but... The, the, the past, they, the, all the people who have given these leadership gifts of, so that, that preach the Word of God, and therefore they are equipping the saints for their own ministries, right? You go out into the world and, and let your light shine because you are being equipped in your local body to do such things. Amen. That's it, part of it. Uh, verse 13, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may be no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom we, the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It's a mouthful. But ultimately, right, one body, many members. Christ is the head. You are the eye. I am the, I am the mouth. Somebody's the shoulder. Somebody's the leg. I'm definitely we, the mouth. No, I'm <laughs> we all work together with different gifts. And yes, you get in Ephesians 11, you get the fivefold ministry gifts of pastoral, like pastoral or like traditional ministry gifts, but that doesn't shirk any script, any Christian of the responsibility to the ministry. I think we, when we talk about the traditions of the church and like standing on those who have come before us, the idea that like, I am so heavily influenced obviously by scripture, but by those who've gone before and written commentaries and monographs and translated scripture that because of their contributions to the body, the body continues to grow because of the pastor's contribution in preaching sermons, preparing Sunday school lessons and whatever it is that the pastor is doing, the body continues to grow. And that's, that's really should be the truth for all the saints because as the saints are living out their God given gifts in the context of the body, both in actual formal church settings and in the world, the church continues to grow. And it only does so when working under, in accordance with the Spirit and the gifts that, that God has given you. And again, that's why we've all been given different gifts. What good it would, would it be if we all were great at talking and no one could listen? Right? It doesn't do good. What good is it if we have a whole bunch of teachers and no students? or a whole bunch of students and no teachers, or a whole bunch of servants and no leaders, right? We were given specific gifts for a reason, and sometimes those take time to discover and time to develop. But I will tell you, some of the most godly people that I know, based on their the fruits that they bear, are not in pastoral ministry. The, the, those that have, they recognize their call to the church. They have ser like either a servant's heart, or like just a Sunday school teacher's heart for kids, and they live out their gift so well that it's just it's it's wonderful to see, and it's really it's an encouragement to see that the body works this way. And again, it's really humbling that God would allow His church to work this way, and He didn't you know overtly say, "Hey, you're 
speak from heaven. Hey, Nate, you're going to be our pastor. God didn't, I didn't get that call. I, I, that, that call came through life experience in, in part. And some of those who who are close to me, but the same is true for many of us. So sometimes it takes time to develop those spiritual gifts. And if you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, go to church. Absolutely. Because if you don't know, somebody's going to find them or they're going to work themselves out just by you being who you are and God working in you and others working in you. And it's, it's just a wonderful process of kind of, I think the, the kids my age call it doing life together. Yeah, it's very well put, doing life together, quote unquote. But that's not quite the hip lingo anymore, Nate. Yeah, well, I'm not hip. You, you were saying all this hip lingo earlier, and I was No, so, I was very proud of myself. I was Sorry, so Lord, confused. forgive me for my pride. But, you know, when you work with the youth like I've been able to over the years, and you pick up on some of their hip lingo, and you feel young and, like, very young, like you're hip and with it and cool. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to drop some of those out there. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> But the body too, right? We, we talk about working together, but it, it should be unified. And it's really sad to see that so many denominations have either forsaken scripture or said, hey, we know scripture the right way and no one else does. And those are kind of two extreme examples, but they, they take away from the, the church universal. And so we just need to be very careful when we label denominations and label people, because there's also the idea that people in these denominations... Uh, that we say are not right might also be saved. Like I would submit to you that the the Roman Catholic Church teaches some things that are contrary to Scripture. But would I call every single Roman Christian not a Christian? Roman Catholic not a Christian? No, because I don't know their hearts. That's that's between them and God. Would I continue to encourage my brothers and sisters and continue to encourage them to to plumb the depths of Scripture and the depths of God? Absolutely, because there they will find the truth, right? And they will find whatever it is they're searching for. Not you will find. Not on Sunday, not from the priest, not from the pastor. Right? The pastor can preach the word of God and there's some things that can be revealed there, but their own personal study also goes miles. No. I'm just reminded too of the the quote that came I've heard R C say it. It's on it's etched on the doors of our church. Uh, it says in essentials unity, in non essentials liberty, and in all things charity. And that's kind of what this next verse says. We talk about Colossians 3, uh, starting in verse 14. Paul says, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So just, again, that reminder of this church is not supposed to be divisive. And it's hard because we're people and we have egos and power trips. And even in in our local body, we see, you know, these, these power struggles that seem to happen because we are sinful. We don't let... We're not, we don't sacrifice ourselves to Christ daily, but Paul really admonishes against that, right? He, he says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. And obviously he promotes singing. Singing's good in church. That's okay. It's not, excuse me, what worship is holy, but it is part of it. Yeah. But he says, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, right? As you sacrifice yourself to Christ daily, as you submit to him, everything is done through him and for him. And part of that is working out your spiritual gifts in the context of the world and of the church. And that grows the body and that unifies the body and it strengthens the body, right? Christ says to Peter, he said, on this rock, and I don't think he was talking about Peter. I would, I would agree with you. <laughs> but he says, on this rock, I will build my church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What was the rock he was building on? Probably himself. Yeah. Or some foundational no, truth. No, I, yeah, no, I was... But right, but the gates of hell will not prevail, not just against Christ, but against his church. And that he's perfecting his church for the day in which he will finally and fully, because he has already defeated sin, death, and the devil, but he has allowed them to to remain for a time. We were talking about glorification, right? 
But yes, at the end of all things, when he finally defeats sin, death, and the devil for all of eternity and puts them officially in their place, then yes, the gates of hell will not prevail. Also true, whatever will God has, the devil is still subject to it. Which is crazy. Right? Everything is subject I mean, I, I, to the will I, I, of God. I think, I think Job outlines that pretty well. But anyway, um, really quick, Nia, before you continue, I just also amen to everything you said. That was great. Does also, look at that reading you did in Colossians 3. It's talking about we were called in one body. Yeah, we're unified, or to be unified in Christ. But there, that idea that we're called in one body, would you say it carries some implications? Like, of, like our duty to the fact that we're not just ourselves? Yeah, absolutely. We are not just ourselves. We're living for our brothers. I mean, we're living for Christ. Uh, well, amen. But, but we're living for our brothers and sisters. Paul, Paul says that, you know, Paul says on one hand that I, I became all things to all men to win some, in order that I might win some. But on the other, the other side of that coin, he basically says you shouldn't do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Yeah. And so that means there are things that I think that are not sins, that are genuinely not sins, that I abstain from because I have friends that I, if I engage in these things could cause them to sin. Yeah. And, and that's bearing with the weakness of others, right? Bearing one another's burdens. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Good and illustration. That's, and that's part of the Christian experience too, right? There yeah. are people who have gone through things and battled sins and addictions that I've never battled. And so they're more fully equipped to counsel and to come alongside a brother who is struggling with these things yeah. than I am. And, and consequently, I've been through things that others have not, and, and which equips me to be able to relate to these things. And I, I'm still going through things that are um, giving me new experiences that are allowing me more perspectives and wider perspectives that I never thought I would go through even as a Christian, and now are providing me even a greater and deeper perspective that I can share. And just seeing those, how those things all kind of work together and that God tends to allow people like that to be placed together in these situations (laughs) that they can help each other to grow is just fascinating to see the Word of God. But that's why it's so important to go to church. And I think we we miss that, especially post-COVID, 21st century, all churches are a lot, pretty much all churches are still live streaming and live streaming is great to a point, right? You, you can take a vacation. It's okay for Christians to go on vacation. <laughs> Wrong. <can>. No, <laughs> but, you go on, but you go on vacation. It's also okay to live stream church on a Sunday while you're on vacation. You don't have to just completely miss church or you are more than welcome to find a local body at a church or wherever you're vacationing. I think either one would be an adequate choice. You don't just, Hey, Not it's both. vacation. We're skipping, we're skipping God this week. But at the same time, if we're just staying home every week and we're just watching church on the TV because I I can go to church in my PJs, well, that's great. You're hearing the word of God. Amen. But at the same time, are you engaging in fellowship with your fellow Christians? I would probably think not. You might be during the week, but I, I would tend to doubt it since this idea of corporate worship on Sunday. And we do tend as Western Christians to overemphasize Sundays and not the whole week. But I think, too, we, if you're live streaming on Sunday, you're probably cashed in the rest of the week, too. Okay. But again, it's not just Sundays. Are you in a weekly Bible study with anybody during the week? Do you go to a weekly Bible study at church on Wednesdays if you have one? Do you have any meetings you tend, like with the pastors or older brothers in Christ that are more mature that kind of guide you and disciple you? Sorry, just adding into your thoughts there. Yeah, are you getting counseling from a pastor? Do you have a prayer chain? Are you, you know, engaging in personal Bible study, but are you even engaging in Bible study with your wife, your kids? Um, are you doing ministry at home? That's that's part of the body of Christ, too. Yeah. It's just, I think we forget that just because we don't, going to church is important, I would argue, but it's would, not the yeah. only thing. Because, I mean, relationship with God is, is the only thing, but part of that is going to church. And, and the writers of the writer of Hebrews tells us this, as I so wrongly quoted, is not Hebrews eleven twenty five. It is Hebrews ten. It's all right. You, you I mean you were right. The verse itself was correct. <laughs> so Hebrews ten. We'll start in verse twenty three. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That day's Tuesday, by the way. I'm just kidding. 
Just teasing. Yes. It's not. <laughs> it is not, probably. Um, Couldn't resist. Sorry, I'll, I'm back to serious. The mode. day is the day is capitalized, at least in the ESV. Uh, I would tend to think that he's talking about the day of the Lord. I would, I would which tend to agree with you. the apostles really thought and lived as it was imminent. They, they, and they, unfortunately, I think too often in 21st century, we don't live it's as it's imminent phenomenal we, point we yes. think it's far off right we don't see the day approaching we think it's we've got years and years and just for all i know he this. could come before i get home tonight I, 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 i'm sorry i just literally i have so many things to say i won't because for sake of time and for your sake of your time nate's time but i literally just wrote an essay about this and i could not agree more it's a very phenomenal point and it's probably because i talked about this and we were talking about amos last week you're welcome <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. I don't think that's why he wrote the paper, but that's okay. I mean, it definitely had some impact, but no, it was a, a prompt. But yes, about specifically talking about what Nate just hit, the apostles, their view, and the way they thought and wrote and how God inspired was that this coming of Christ, this day of the Lord is imminent. As Jesus taught, come as a thief in the night. Mm-hmm. So that, I mean, but again, if, if it's imminent, the imminence, the unity, the body of Christ building one another up, using our spiritual gifts, all these things should affect how we live. And it should affect our view of the body of Christ. Scripture says has so much more than we've even covered here to talk about the function of the body in Christ. If you want to read, just read any or all of the Pauline epistles. It pretty much <laughs> talks about church life, the body of Christ. Excuse me, doing church, doing life together as the body of Christ, being unified, being humble, um, some cautions about false teachings. Like it's it's doing a study on Paul in the New Testament is very helpful if you're struggling with idea issues of unity of you know going to church other issues too sin issues and all that but there's yeah. this idea that is pervasive throughout Paul's but the question is, so you, you we we all agree you know I think you need to find a church yeah so how do you find a church what does that look like Andrew no it's a phenomenal yeah so that's actually so it literally in my segment notes here on that that was a tr- phenomenal that's what we call a transition there folks but um segue no, transition, I like that better. But segue, fine, fine. Boom, roasted, no. But literally how I wrote it here was with this, all of this in mind that we just talked about, right? How on earth do I determine which church is the quote-unquote right church, right? Um, and there's a lot of methodologies to it. We're going to have a whole episode probably or maybe a series on this. So this is just some basic guidelines right to kind of help us in the in the walk and identification and spoiler alert we're going to kind of breeze through these um because one we're short on time and two either next week or the week after our academia today is on nine marks of a healthy church yeah uh so that's really where we're going to take a deeper dive into this but we do want to give you some baseline no absolutely so um what i have here in my overview is what we look for and by the way i'm going to outline this right now the scripture references that i'm going to hit are in order of the overview, which I'm about to give. So things to look for is the leadership, or things to look at rather, leadership of the specific church, the doctrine of the specific church, and assessing whether or not they appeal to your feelings or they lead you by the spirit or they encourage you to grow in the spirit. Um, so again, in that order, uh, we see, for example, with leadership, scripture, the, uh, the Pauline epistles or the pastoral epistles, if you will, of Paul's, that God uses here. There's multiple examples. For the sake of time, I'm not going to do 1 Timothy 3 because it's the entire chapter. So if Titus 1, verses 6 through 9, the scripture says, Namely, if any man is beyond reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of indecent behavior or rebellion, for the overseer must be beyond reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not overindulging in wine. I'm just going to pause that for a moment. Not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, self-controlled, righteous, holy, there's that magical word, disciplined, holding firmly the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching. Again, that's the, just think of that as scripture and proper doctrine. So that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. So those are a lot of attributes, okay? Um, and a lot of things of, you know, living above reproach. What does that mean? We'll get into that more in depth, but looking at the leadership and what I would even encourage when you're talking about that is most churches will have their statements of faith and they'll have brief bios on their pastors. I would encourage you to, to assess that or look at it and, 
and see. And if you have questions, I, I can almost guarantee you, no matter the denomination, no matter the pastor, they will will they're they are more than willing to answer questions. If you you humbly and lovingly reach out and say, "Hey, I was looking at this. I'm confused. You know, what are your thoughts on X, Y, or Z, or any, any follow ups you might have?" I know they'd be more than happy because I know our pastor is. I've worked with several. Ge- as a general rule, they, and if they don't, then it's kind of another you know. I, you know, it kind of gives you what you're looking for. But again, another example would be First Timothy 3, which talks about not just a pastor, but a deacon, talks about an elder. Um, the outline character traits, right? Again, it, be careful in these contexts not to have one experience. You go, oh, I know that they're not hospitable because I had one interaction with them. That's not obviously what we're doing here. But give it time and get to know them. Yes, maybe you have something to say. But not too much time. Yeah. Because then you're just going to church hop and church hop and church hop. Eventually, you need to find something you need to find somewhere yeah. to call that's home. That's fair. Yeah. So it's you, a, it's you a gotta, natural tension. you got to find a balance. Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. And then nextly, we see improper doctrine, right? So when we look at it, Scripture exhorts us here, in, speaking of 1 Timothy, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 10, in pointing out these things to the brothers, again, some context, this is Paul encouraging Timothy, a young pastor at Ephesus. So again, at beginning of verse six, in pointing out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of good doc- of the good doctrine which you have been, in- been following. But stay away from worthless stories that are typical of old women. Rather, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily training is just slightly beneficial, but godliness is beneficial for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance, for it is th- for this we labor and strive, because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all mankind, especially believers. Nate, you kind of you have something to say there? I always have something to yeah, say. Yeah, no, that's good. I was just, uh, you, that was interesting. I saw that reaction. You got what do you have to say? I don't know. What did you say? Oh, I thought you, when I was reading that scripture, you looked like you had a... I okay. had a thought. What was that? So we talk about doctrine. Yeah. Just, again, we this is the purpose of this show, right? Doctrine comes from scripture. We let God Amen. define our terms. We Amen. let God define our doctrine. We let scripture define our doctrine. And that's the problem sometimes with some of these churches is that especially the ones that say I'm right and everyone else is wrong is they're just they've pigeonholed themselves into these doctrines and they're not wholly biblical. Um, they're partially and they are to, they tend to be based on scripture and some of them are better than others. Um, so I wouldn't call them heretical and just would caution against their, their, the lack of unity that's there. But again, letting scripture define doctrine. Because that's where it comes from. No, amen. Doctrine, religion, Christianity, all comes from God. Well, when we think of doctrine, we think of teaching, right? That's what doctrine means, right? So proper teaching comes from Scripture. And you hit it out of the park. That's actually what I was going to say, so um, ditto. No, <laughs> but no, absolutely correct. So Very nice. w- when you assess that, right, you got to think of, obviously, everything says under the authority of Scripture. It flows from there. And that's and they point out a good warning sign, too. If you see some a church that holds to a certain doctrine and says, well, we have it all figured out. Everyone other church is wrong. Um, that should send up some red flags at the very least. Um, and maybe tell you maybe to find somewhere else. Cause usually that comes from, it's just toxic. That general idea is toxic. I would submit. Um, but when, then we go, then the last step, which kind of flows, if you notice this leadership kind of not when say upholds, but leadership, as we see here in first Timothy four, that a leader is meant to, promulgate proper doctrine, right? Put out proper teaching, which is only from the word of God. Um, And from there, that's where we get the doctrine. Then we go into, is it feeling centered? Like, is it appealing to your emotions? Or is it encouraging you to be led by the spirit and grow in the spirit? By the spirit, we mean the Holy Spirit. Um, So we see a couple examples of this in 2 Peter, uh, verse 13, or verses, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1 through 3 I don't know. I, let me give me a second here as I get my cue right. I typed in 13 for some silly reason. Now, well, now I did 1 through 13. My goodness, I'm all thumbs today. All right, 2 Peter, verses 1 through 3. I'm sorry, 2 Peter 2. My goodness. Getting late, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says in 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, but false prophets also appeared among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you 
who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master, that being God, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their indecent behavior, and because of them, the way of the truth will be mangled. And their greed, and, and in their greed, rather, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So obviously here we're talking about false teachers, right? Paul, or Paul, my goodness. Wow. Peter is, um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on, ladies and gentlemen. But Peter is encouraging and warning, actually encouraging to be aware of and warning of false teachers that are eminent. And this warning, by the way, is seen throughout the New Testament, um, specifically in, you know, in Acts, in the Pauline epistles, in Peter, James. We see this theme of there will come times when people will amass themselves, uh, you know, itchers of their ear. Um, that's me paraphrasing wholeheartedly from uh, 1 Timothy. But nonetheless, um, this idea of false teachers coming, right? And what do false teachers tend to do? What, do, what are heresies in general? Generally, again, generally, so be careful. You take this with a grain of salt. But generally, they're appealing to one's emotions, right? They sound good and they make one feel good. And um, that can be very dangerous, Especially when it's not subjected again to the word of God. Like I would never want to discount someone's emotional experience as long as it's in line with scripture. S- in line with scripture. Uh, we had an interesting conversation um, with a brother in Christ over an ordination council. Yep. And he comes from a more open denomination. And so gifts of the spirit are a little more freely practiced and maybe a little bit more loosely controlled by the church. And so he asked, he asked a question that was a little bit concerning, but he came from a good place. And once we had some discussion, it was nice to see that even his idea of these gifts was still sent, even though I disagree, were still centered in scripture. No, it was, that was very, and that's where he, he came from. And that's, that's the thing. We talk about leadership doctrine, spirits, uh, center versus feeling centered. I think that's where we really should, again, everything should be subject to scripture. And I think one of the things, and this is spoiler alert to our academia today, is the first thing that he says is is a mark of a healthy church is that they preach scripture expositionally. Yeah. And if, and then that's really how it should be preached. Even if you're, even if you're used going by topics or even if you're going by like series, um, we did a series at our local church called Kings and the King. And it was kind of an overview of the Kings of Israel and led us into the Advent season where we talked about the king. And we obviously didn't hit every single king of Israel because that would take a lot of time. But every passage where we dealt with a king was unpacked expositionally. And that's how that's still exposition, whether it's, you know, perfectly in order. Now, I prefer book by book, verse by verse. That's my style. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that. As long as you're exegeting and, exp- and expositing the word, sometimes the form is a little different. Yeah. So today we appreciate you joining us for our discussion on the beginnings of the Christian journey and maybe the reassessment of the Christian journey. You know, maybe maybe you're not a new Christian, but you realize, hey, maybe I'm not in the church I need to be in. Or, hey, maybe maybe I miss the mark when it comes to um, living for him and not just, hey, I'm saved, I can still live for myself. If you missed any of these marks, I would, if you, if any of this speaks to you, I would very strongly urge you to go talk to your pastor. Um, if you're a member of a local church, if you're not, find a church, talk to a pastor. Um, By the way, this is not a condemnation either. No, absolutely. This is, again, the purpose of this is to build up. If you said something we felt was offensive, feel free to email us and we can we can have discussion. Uh, we don't mean to tear down. We mean to build up. We all have our own walks, and they all look very different. So we, I would never discourage, I would never try to discourage a brother in his walk, even if it looks very different from mine. Because um, I know I went through my own walk, which is very different from everybody else's, and I've, I've felt enough shame for that. So that's okay. Um, but that being said, just again, we, we pray that you continue to walk this path wherever you are on your journey, and we, we pray that you bring others along with you, whether long-term brothers and sisters who continue to help build you up and build the body up, or you, you make some new disciples, uh, as Christ commanded in the Great Commission, to make disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey 
um, all that he has commanded. Except Samaria. We don't like Samaria. I'm just kidding. No, we like them all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's okay. So if we want to hit that verse of the week again in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And what an honor to be, again, being at enmity with God and now being part of the body of Christ. Praise God. It's just a true honor. So as always, feel free to submit your questions, comments, concerns to fortitudeintruth316 at gmail.com. We would absolutely love to hear from you, even if it's simple as, hey, love the show. Um, don't need a pat on the back. We, we hope it really blesses you more than just your listening pleasure, and it really impacts your life. We hope that the Word of God speaks to you. If you have ideas for future shows, future topics you'd like to see addressed, we'd love to hear those. Uh, we have some stuff lined up, but hey, we're open to whatever it is you guys want to hear. So we are we we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be here without you guys. So we very much appreciate it. And finally, again, just a reminder, please to join us on Christmas Day. We are going to be releasing a Christmas special designed to remember and celebrate the birth of our incarnate Lord. It's super excited for that show. Uh, we will not be hosting it on Christmas Day. It will be pre-recorded. Uh, there will be no live stream on Christmas <laughs> because we will be spending time with our families, as should you. I think it's a time not just for fellowship of families, too, but just remember, you know, the the reason for this, as corny as that is, Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen. But, hey, if you forget that we're having an episode on Christmas Day, if you subscribe, you'll automatically get notified, and then you could just listen to it. Shameless plugs. <laughs> But with that, I just want to close this in prayer. Father, thank you for, again, your word and all that you have to say about all these different things that can help us live for you. The the fact that you sent your son to die and to save us is astonishing in and of itself, and we are truly thankful for that. But thank you for also for the gift of your word that can help help us make decisions and live for you and, and be conformed to the likeness of your son. Lord, we thank you for this gift and we, we pray that it would empower each and every one of us as well as the indwelt spirit. Lord, continue to just work in the hearts and minds of your body for your purposes that you might receive all glory and honor. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join us again next week for Fortitude and Truth and also on Christmas Day. <laughs>